Should we get started? I think we should, yes. Let's do it. All right, well, welcome everyone. My name is Katie Kapler and I will be um, one of your hosts today. I am the co-founder and CEO of Inscribe. And um, for those of you who might not be familiar with us, Inscribe is a virtual community platform that helps connect students to classmates, staff, teachers, faculty, anyone that they need to collaborate with to get answers or just make connections so they can succeed in their learning. Um, I'm gonna do a couple of logistics really quickly before I introduce our awesome panelists for today. Um, so we really would love for this to be an interactive session. Um, you know, we hope that we can all learn as much from the participants um, and attendees at this webinar as you're gonna learn from us. So please feel free to share your thoughts, ideas, um, in the chat as we go. So you'll see there's both a chat feature and a Q&A feature. If you have a question specifically for the panelists, you can put it in Q&A. That's not visible to the rest of the participants. So we all encourage you whenever possible to use the chat so everyone can see what we're talking about. Um, and I'm joined today by Danielle Bonner from our team. She will be monitoring both spaces and answering some of the questions there. And then she'll make sure that myself and the panelists know questions that are coming in so we can address them throughout the session. But please feel free to jump in there. Um, and with that, I will introduce our amazing panelists, both from Greenfield Commonwealth Virtual School. So first we have Sara Jordan, who is the Director of Accountability and Student Services at GCVS. So GCVS is a fully online public school and it serves students from across Massachusetts who are looking for a learning community that has greater accessibility and flexibility. She's an advocate for school improvement and literacy development with a focus on inclusive practices for marginalized populations. Sara also works with schools participating in the DESE Early Grades Literacy Grant and develops a, has developed a course in sheltered instruction with the UDL, the Universal Design Language Framework. Um, she has spent her whole career in education working to make a difference for students. And my other panelist, Chris Moody, who is the Director of Technology at GCVS. And he is really focused on providing awareness and understanding for the technology solutions that empower the virtual school. So Chris works with his team to figure out what are really the needs of the middle and high school students, the teachers and the staff, and make recommendations on technology to fit into the, um, that can address their needs and fit into the overall technology landscape. He has also worked with a number of IT teams, including the director of IT for Springfield School District. So welcome, Sara and Chris. I'm so excited to have you guys here today. Um, so uh, I'm just going to kick off by talking. Well, oh, sorry, excuse me. So we would love to know who is even in the audience and participating with us today. So if you have a minute, just drop into the chat. Let us know who you are where you come from, what brings you here today, um, and if there's anything specifically that you're hoping we'll talk about or that you're gonna learn today, please put it in there so we make sure that we cover that in the course of the conversation. But again, welcome everyone. Um, so I'm just gonna do a little framing up of why we're here. Uh, I think everybody recognizes that the past year has been extremely challenging one, um, particularly for our students and young people. And I think we're all looking for ways that we can create better connections and um, maintain some of the flow of conversation and relationship that kind of came naturally to us before COVID. And I think what's really interesting about the work that Sarah and Chris have been doing is, you know, working in a virtual environment all the time and having students that are fully online, they're always seeing some of the challenges that many of us are just now facing with the limitations of being at home and learning online. And so I thought it would be great to learn from their experience about um, how they've tackled some of these challenges. And moreover, um, I, I'm sure we have some folks in the audience who are from K-12, others who are from higher ed. Uh, I will say that in the conversations I've had with school leaders, and university leaders, I do hear a consistent theme, which is we want to give our students spaces to talk to one another. And it doesn't really matter what age those students are. 
they share a lot of the same goals um, and, and desires and really could benefit from some of the same solutions. So I think a lot of the conversation we have today will be relevant across all of those spaces. So with that, I will stop talking because I'm not the interesting one here. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chris, do you mind just giving us a quick kind of little background about Greenfield Commonwealth and a little about the school's mission? Absolutely. Um, so Greenfield Commonwealth Virtual School came about in the state of Massachusetts as a sort of experiment. Um, the State Department of Education, uh, actually about 10 years ago now, uh, decided that they wanted to open uh, uh, space for totally online virtual schools, uh, just as a test. In the state of Massachusetts, there's only two of us. Uh, the other school focuses uh, exclusively on asynchronous learning. Uh, kids are going at their own pace. Um, we initially started at the other end of the spectrum and we're doing synchronous. So the kids are meeting in classes, uh, just like they would uh, in a brick and mortar. Uh, in this case, it's online using um, some online meeting software. Uh, we're kind of branching out now and, and, look, and looking to offer both aspects of it. Um, mostly with the idea of uh, giving our students and families choice, uh, how, when they can learn, what they're going to learn. Um, we've also expanded into a partnership with a community college uh, close to us, GCC, uh, where kids can actually use their online um, schooling and go to uh, college. And uh, it's absolutely possible for our kids to graduate from high school with their associate's degree. Um, we look to uh, tailor the education to each student uh, and, uh, you know, focusing on uh, what their interests are. Um, this has really changed the dynamic for plain brick and mortar uh, education. Um, and, uh, you know, something that we were missing was the engagement with the kids, the more social engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that we've really been exploring and adding here. That's terrific. And then, and I think that was a nice segue into, you know, what were some of the challenges that you guys have seen by launching this fully online school? Different modality, different setup for your students. And Sarah, I think you had some thoughts on you know, what, were, what were you guys seeing and hoping to address? So before the pandemic, we still had at least several times a year, we would meet as a community. We went to the Museum of Science in Boston. It was a field day. There were, we would have picnics across the, the state. We could meet in public. And when that shut down and we couldn't meet at all, the, the problems of, of just that need to socialize became much more um, evident. But we also, when we were at that point, our we, our student cap was 750 students and we suddenly had a cap of 1,000 and our waiting list was 1,100 parents. So our portal was lighting up and the phone call, the phones were lighting up all the time with people wanting information. So we had too, we were too small to address the need for us and we still had the need of trying to get people to talk to each other because people are social. And I met with, well, Fred Scott who works for Inscribe gave me a call and, and I was interested in this because I understood Inscribe to be like this big information kiosk where I could channel all these questions and information and, and not have to give up a lot of my staff resources to answering questions. They could be answered at this big kiosk. And then as I talked to Fred, I realized, oh no, it's the whole room. It's the whole community room. So I went over to Chris. Chris, what's your title again? Uh, Dark Overlord of Technology, Destroyer of Student Fun. <laughs> Destroyer of Children Student Fun. So I figured, I figured, Chris, if he could poke any holes in this, he would. But this, Inscribe as a platform met two particular needs, which is to manage the, the number of questions that we have, because one of the, we have pandemic related challenges of just being suddenly getting too big and getting too well known without having the capacity and then not having not finding ways for kids could meet. At least you could say to someone, say to kids, well, in a month, we're all going to meet at a particular place, you know, one of the zoos or something, and we'll hang out there. We couldn't do that. But we had this safe place where kids could talk and the adults could step back because they were monitored in other ways. Um, so those, those were the 
two challenges we had. And I think you touched on some of the statistics that we're seeing here, which is, you know, in that move online and when you remove the opportunity, even if you're an online student, you still had some opportunity for in-person interaction. When you remove that, it caused some, you know, shifts in sort of the mentality and motivation, I think, of a lot of our, of a lot of our learners. Um, and some of those statistics being reflected here, was that, does that resonate with what you guys were seeing as well? It also, because we had a, our traditional population has been medically fragile, and so they're already, then we got this big mix of other kinds of students, so the need for interaction and in all these new students, yes, we were really particularly afraid that some of these students coming in having not had that much online would really withdraw because they're so used to face-to-face. -face. Right. Um, and we measure yeah. engagement you, you through it. Go on, Chris. Um, we also have a big focus on making sure that we're following um, federal guidelines, such as SIPA. Um, one of the uh, caveats in, in, uh, in uh, the CIPA uh, legislation is that we have to monitor uh, what students are up to, uh, what, what, whether they're communicating via email, chat rooms, whatever. Um, if they're part of school, um, you know, the school needs to monitor that. Now there's a big debate. If this is happening from home, do we need to do that or not? Um, at GCBS, we've taken it on upon ourselves um, that yes, we, you know, if we're providing the, uh, the Chromebook or computer to these students, we need to make sure that we're doing that, which has led us to lock down a lot of the, uh, the fun stuff, which is why I say I'm the destroyer of student fun. Uh, email, stuff like that. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's controlled, it's monitored, and, and in, in a lot of cases blocked. So kids are going to the, uh, had been going to the number one um, chat pl uh, platform at American high schools, uh, which is Google. Uh, spinning up a Google Doc and communicating in there, it was becoming clickish. So only their friends were going on. We're, we're using a, a platform that actually scans and monitors the, uh, the Google environment. So um, we're good with that, but we wanted to have that more inclusiveness where the kids are getting together and helping each other um, and communicating within the site of uh, teachers. Yes. And I think you, were, you had told me earlier that the, the number one chat tool all of a sudden became a Google Doc because, you know, to your point, other things were getting locked down and students left to their own devices will figure out how to, how to talk to one another. So I love that you're trying to balance these two needs, right? You have to keep your students safe and make sure that you're not, you know, that you're living up to your responsibilities. Um, but at the same time, know that they really need these spaces. And so how do you create opportunities for them that are safe and monitored, but also kind of student driven and open? So it's a very difficult balancing act, I think. It is. Uh, it is a very difficult ba uh, balance to reach with our students. And I know we talked about sort of the absence of in-person spaces, which for you guys, you know, not being able to do those meetings that you were doing periodically, I think for, for other institutions who maybe weren't fully online, especially in the K-12 space, I, I can't remember if we talked about this, but the idea like the cafeteria, like my own children have now said to me, I miss going to the cafeteria. because That's where all the chat chit chat takes place, right? So just those opportunities for kind of passing by in the hallway and um, the casual conversations that people, are so used to having. Um, so let's see what, so we have these challenges, you know, you have the student population, they're already wanting more sort of interaction with each other and then COVID takes that back even further. So what were some of the things that you thought about doing with Inscribe that allowed you to balance that safety and the, the social needs of your students? Well, I think the answer is right there. We, um, it's funny, the original impetus was to support parents, but the first thing we built were the two commons, the middle school hangout and the high school commons. And later on, we'll look at data at how quickly the kids jumped into that. Um, the, that was, it was clearly a need for students to talk to each other and also to feel safe because 
when teachers are in a course and kids are coming into, you have the usual banter at the front door. Everything's a metaphor for a physical building. But there's a lot of kids who don't say a lot and you don't get to know them so that we wanted a place where, where teachers and adults and other kids could just sort of hear what was going on to those who speak less, who, who don't talk as much in the classroom. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the things you guys did from the outset, which was brilliant and maybe slightly terrifying to some of the folks on this uh, webinar was you really let the students run it. You know, um, I do want to talk a little bit about why you made that decision and kind of how that works in practice. Well, yeah, our, our the kids really got to go. Uh, we, we just gave them free reign in these two spaces. Um, we let them, you know, pick their topics. We gave them some starter topics and, and they branched off from it and they um and, and they've really been driving the whole process. We, we, we do moderate the space. Um, Inscribe has um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the monitor there, Rosie, um, that uh, flags uh, posts for us, uh, helps bring our attention to problem areas. It's been very easy um, to let the kids go with this and they have really made the space their own. And uh, it's, it's we, you know, there was some concern about this, like how difficult the space would be um, to give them free reign. And it turns out when they know they're being monitored um, and they know that they, you know, they can lose, they can lose uh, access if they're not behaving themselves. They really do tend to behave themselves. Uh, we have had uh, zero needs for further moderation other than just redacting a, a few posts and that's it. There have been no other problems with this. That's one of the right. reasons we decided just to go right into it is one is we're gonna test Rosie. If our kids could not talk freely if, or if we couldn't trust Rosie to monitor, then we didn't want this. And the other thing is I'm, I'm a high school teacher and a middle school teacher and I've seen how much kids love to talk. It's a biological drive and the way boys lean back and they start talking about the latest video game they're playing and kill the death ratios and head counts. And, you know, they have this conversation that usually gets squelched in classrooms. So I thought I, I'm not going to tell them what to say. They're going to figure it out very quickly. <laughs> um, and so, since Rosie's come up for those of those of our attendees that um, aren't familiar, Rosie is uh, a technology and AI component that um, exists within the Inscribe communities. And its job is to kind of monitor what's taking place, um, has the ability to flag posts that seem to be inappropriate, or maybe the emotion of the post is getting riled up. So I think we have an example uh, in a few slides where you can see Rosie in action. But when we talk about Rosie, no, she's not the overlord moderator of all communities quite yet but exists there in the background to help facilitate. Hey, Katie, there is a quick question in the chat. Um, and the question is about the approval process for communities. Um, do you have students creating their own communities or what, what does that typically look like? After we created the initial ones, I put it out there saying, what do you wanna see? And they told me, so no, they don't create their own, but they tell me what they want. And anyway, I just took it on, but it after Chris could do it and any of the moderators could. But yeah, lots really of the just communities wanted... are, are built in a framework and the topics are what the kids can pick on. And uh, it, it's, you know, you can make one community do many different things by the, via the topics, so. Yeah, so you put in some starter topics that the students could essentially have conversations around, but then welcomed them to suggest other topics. They're probably not in there or they're not in there creating them themselves. There is sort of a gateway to creating those, right. those new topics and areas, but um, making sure they feel welcome to have those contributions. I think that's great. Um, and then I know we're gonna look at some examples of stuff that went on in your community. Do you wanna touch on quickly the four types of support we are going after? And then I know we do, we have a specific example of each so we can dig into them a little bit more. Chris, do you want this? Or you want me to take it? Go ahead with it. Because no, Chris is always going to go for informational because he's he's a superior <laughs> of fun. But um, for me, being a middle school teacher, it's all about belonging and finding the kids who want to talk to you about the stuff you love to talk about. And that makes it, you know, then you have the emotional bonding, the affirmational. 
And so the informational, that, that was gonna be the parent portal. Later, we we're gonna try and do, we are still trying to do more academic stuff around the school. Um, we found that student, the, the kids have no problem sharing their artwork, sharing their, their poems and getting affirmations from that. They feel like they belong. And I pulled out one about someone who, this is not an example you chose, but she, someone wrote, I'm glad I'm not alone. Honestly, you have to find people in life that are there for you instead of believing there's someone in the sky that's there for you. They started to make, the, they, they started to, I think within, within two weeks, we started seeing all of these points touched on. And all I wanted was kids go have a place where they could talk about Minecraft or you know, the, the newest manga novels. <laughs> and so I told you I was going to not cry in this webinar. So you, I, you pulled that out. I know specifically to test me on that, but it's been um, really lovely to see the students participating with each other. So let's look at some more of those examples. Um, so in terms of belonging, you know, we've talked about interests and ideas, and here are some of the great examples that popped in. Um, Sara, do you want to talk about this since this is near and dear to your heart? Um, and this is back to the question. When my question went out to students, asking them, what would you like in particular? There's always something about Minecraft and music. Um, the thing is, a lot of times you might have Michael Jackson, but someone draws a picture of Michael Jackson. So how are you going to both of goes in? So that the, the, you can never be sure what you find inside a particular sub-community, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But this really captures it. We have the video gamers. We have music all the time and um, the art. And one that we didn't pick any up because it would have been too personal, but kids share their own writing. Mm, yes. So they really are, you know, craving that opportunity to yes. express their non-academic side and find other, other students and, and classmates that feel that same way. It's very clear. Um, and then this, I think, is such a great example. This was the initial post. And then we have the, the follow-up right afterward. Do you want to set the stage for this, Sara? Nobody probably cares, but I thought I'd say bye, everyone. Because we have a lot of churn in our school, much less this year. This has been, we have a lot more stable, but it's usually about a third of our students will roll in and roll out. Because we're, we don't tend to be the school of first choice for anyone. Um, we have district schools. So yeah, this is someone who hadn't been with us very long. And all right, I'm gonna go on to something else. Um, don't let the door hit me on the way out, so to speak. <laughs> Nobody probably cares, but I thought I'd say bye. And what did we get here? There, there we go. There was the responses. So 11 people jumped in within, I think it was five minutes or something. I mean, it was just within the quick hour and these were all the great responses that she got. And Katie, I know you're gonna, you wanna do this, but I'll do it for it. Look how she edited her original prep. She, she got changed in this process because she took away, probably nobody cares. Right. You know, it's by everyone with that, yeah, big exclamation point. Yeah. So I think really knowing that these community spaces can have those two sides, you know, certainly there's gonna be the informational piece, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you know, not underestimating how great an impact, um, just hearing back from somebody and having somebody, somebody say me too, or I care about that as well, how big of a, um, an impact that can have on an individual. Uh, and here's another great example kind of in that same space. I'll let you speak to that, Sarah. Um, I can't remember which one we chose. All right, this is another one of that particular students, which is this student had reached out saying, you know, does anyone really care? And a lot of students wrote back and said, there's a lot of fake people out there. So don't feel your, oh, she didn't have a cell phone and she was thought she was busy on life. Well, turns out she wasn't. <laughs> and was feeling much more positive. And there's a question in the chat about being concerned about bullying. That is first and foremost on our mind all the time. So we were blown away by these kind of supports in which kids reach out and say, you're just fine the way you are. What you got is what you got. What are you gonna make with it? That really affirmative. And luckily, and we have Rosie who pulls out Anytime there's something at least bit hit, uh, heated, I just got one right before I logged on, which was um, the family had turned off Hulu and, and the girl posted, you're killing me here. You took away my Hulu. Killing got flagged immediately. <laughs> um, I think the word neck gets people flagged. It's, it's, there's a list of several hundred words that 
will merely trigger a response to the moderators or a note to the moderators to look into this. And we've had no incidents of bullying. Yeah, no, quite the opposite, right? Mm. Yeah. But I think that, and, I, and it is a concern. I mean, I think people do definitely say, you know, we wanna make sure that the communities are healthy and appropriate and people are respecting the norms. And I, I agree, I think that combination of knowing it is moderated, it's not an anonymous space. So there is a level of you know, maturity that people kind of bring to the table in that regard. And then also feeding off each other and just seeing like, I'm gonna emulate the behavior of the other members of my community because that's the type of space that we're creating, I think can be really powerful as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll say this kind of interaction is something we see all the time in, in communities where one member will feel like I'm the only person that doesn't have a phone. I'm the only person that doesn't understand this concept. I'm the only person that's missing home because I did go away to school. And they'll post something and immediately, you know, five, 10, 20 people will jump in and say, oh, me too, me too, me too. And you can almost see the like, sense the relief in that person that posted it, that they put themselves out there and they found that, you know, emotional support and connection that they were looking for. So I think that's really beautiful. That's, these are the things that make me start to cry with the middle school community. Um, and then this one, I'll give this one to you, Chris, cause I know right in your, in your uh, sweet spot with, I, I need an answer and uh, how can you help me? <laughs> yes, the, uh, and, and this is something that's really great that we've been looking uh, to inscribe for is letting the, giving the kids an opportunity to help other kids. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're looking get, to get set up uh, subject-based areas that are, um, you know, teacher guided. So, you know, kids with questions about homework can post their question about homework and get answers from their peers uh, that the teachers can see and, and, uh, and uh, provide feedback as needed. But, even better, um, here's an example of uh, one of the students um, putting together their own non-school uh, driven club um, on, on writing. And uh, some of the stuff our kids are putting out there is, is great. And I think uh, to, the, to the bullying piece, the kids know on this system, they're not anonymous. We know who they are because they actually have to log into uh, to inscribe, they're logging in via, uh, actually via their Google accounts. Um, but I think they, their, their behavior is, is very appropriate. Yeah. Um, and in this case, they're, uh, uh, they're creating these things themselves and driving their own community. Um, so we're, uh, we're really happy to see this sort of stuff and wholeheartedly encourage it. That's awesome. And here is our, our long awaited um, Rosie example. And I, Danielle, for some reason, when I click on the q and I can't get it to come up. So if we have questions coming in, just interrupt me because um, I'm not able to see them at the moment. Yeah, we do have two questions coming in, but let's go ahead and um, address Rosie real quick. And then we can answer the two questions that have come in. Okay. So you can probably figure that kill is one of those trigger words. And <laughs> I mean, K-pop, K-pop. Oh, wow. This is, this is scary stuff. Um, and then, but I mean, okay, there we keep petting guinea pigs, skateboarding. When kids describe their, their loves, a lot of times it might be a band with a name or a song name that, that's a little bit questionable. And we get that instantly. Um, so it's, I, I love the fact that I can trust this background monitor yeah. to let me know. Because if I'm getting K-pop as something flaggable, I know when I get something re that really worries me, it'll pop right up. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought this was a nice sort of juxtaposition, you know, one that Rosie, you know, in some ways, quote unquote, got wrong, meaning there wasn't anything alarming there, but just being cautious, monitoring for those certain words. And then you can dismiss that alert saying, no, this was actually okay. And, um, and let it go. And then the second one, you know, the system actually started to sense that there was some emotion or maybe somebody who, you know, was feeling a little, yeah upset and again you know you could read this and say you know no problem or you could read this and say you know what maybe I do want to have someone just reach out to that student and make sure that they're doing okay because I see that's the funny thing because the first thing I did for the second one when I got that was skim it I didn't see any of the trigger words and that worries me 
So then I read it and so, several of us, because there's there several moderators got together and talked about it and its implications and there was a plan in place. Um, so there, there are human elements really important, important as well. Yeah, just really being able to sense that, you know, have that sensitivity to understand when people are, might need that personal outreach yeah. and, and helping hand. That's something that Rosie does really well is in looking for these things in, in the moderation tools as well. When, when one of the moderators looks at a post that's been flagged, um, they can go ahead and clear the flag and, and other people know that it's been looked at and, and taken care of. Um, but we do, we do have a process at, the, uh, at our school. Uh, the school safety committee um, also deals with this. We, other systems that generate flags um, for what kids are doing online in their classes, their LMS, um, and, uh, you know, this is a good example, like the second one there, it's, it could go either way. Yeah. And that might be something that we're just going to flag to one of the counselors to say, Hey, you should be aware of this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we kind of keep an eye on things and make sure our kids are staying healthy. Absolutely. That's a, such a great example. So we're going to get into some data in a second, but why don't we pause? I know we had a, I saw one question in the chat, which I'll answer quickly from um, Sue about whether Inscribe can be used with the school LMS. Um, so the answer there is yes. So you can integrate Inscribe into really any of the tools or technology that you're already using. So a lot of times that's the learning management system. Sometimes if you have a student portal or you want to put access points on websites, that can be done as well. So um, it's really designed to integrate into the capabilities that you guys all, um, are already using or your students are already using. And then Danielle, what questions, what are coming in the Q&A side? Sure, so we have two questions. The first one, um, Sar, can you share a little bit about the implementation process and how long did that, that implementation of Inscribe take for you all? Um, my job was to say, hey, this is great. I'll find a grant to pay for it. Um, so I, I, and part of the implementation was looking at the grants I had. I used Title I because this is exactly what Title I is for. Um, we are reducing, re increasing student engagement and we're reaching out because our school is, is um, high dis um, students, economically disadvantaged, as well as we're very high special ed. So I could pay for it with Title I funds in various ways. And the next step is, um, Chris, we're meeting with Inscribe and <laughs> we met every week for a couple of weeks, but my yeah. job was just to show up and say, this is great. Chris, did it, you do anything more than that? I'm sure you must have. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. The, it, it took us two weeks to put it all together and deploy those first two communities. And you can always add on to the communities after that. And that was not that that was a pretty leisurely pace to do in that two weeks. You could do this certainly much less time than that. Uh, we do use the uh, Canvas learning management system and uh, Inscribe uh, does integrate with it quite nicely. Awesome. And do you mind speaking just quickly, because um, I know other people are interested in this, in how you announced the community to your students or made them aware that it existed? What did that process look like? If I remember oh, we just was... said, hey, there's this neat thing. Go on, Chris. <laughs> yeah, that's just what it was. It was an email saying, you know, hey, do you want an area where you guys can meet and, you know, kind of have, you know, some free space where you guys can talk and discuss. We did break up the communities. There's a high school community. There's a middle school community. Uh, community. And uh, really, I think the first few kids got into it and they were, it really took off instantly. Um, I think by the end of the day, we had more than uh, 80 posts, I would say. Uh, and uh, it really spread from there. The kids drove the engagement. Once they figured out, ooh, we've got this space, everybody wanted to come in and take a look at it. Come in and check it out. That's great. And um, Danielle, what was the other question that popped in there? Dara actually already addressed the other question. It was in, in regards to grant funding. Oh, perfect. Well done, Sarah. You can be doing that for you perfectly. Um, well, and so I would love to know from the audience, you know, if you have tried virtual spaces like this before, or um, if you've, you know, what other strategies you've attempted to create opportunities for your students and staff and um, to connect when they're working and learning at a distance. Would love to learn from 
some of the things you've been doing while we bring up this next slide, which is around some of the analytics. I believe that this is the middle school community that we're looking at here. Um, and I'll just say something really quickly. Hopefully I'm not stealing anyone's thunder, but what I love here is you see this real sort of consistent heartbeat of activity along the way. You know, there isn't like a big spike and then everything goes quiet or, you know, sometimes in academic communities, you see like a big spike right before midterms and finals, but this sort of steady drumbeat of participation, I thought was really um, just beautiful to see. I still love that spike when you first implement it. Yes, whoa, there it goes. <laughs> yeah. Word spread fast. Totally. And then something happened right around, I don't know, just before Valentine's Day that got people really excited as well. Um, but any other, any other um, sort of aha moments from the analytics that you're seeing? Well, when I finally figured out how to get here, because um, I didn't play with this aspect. Um, <laughs> It, it was truly amazing, but I think going, there was the support we got from Inspire in terms of, especially me, because I'm not, I can talk data, I can talk as a jargon, but really walking into it, I need a lot of handholding and that the pace, as Chris said, was so leisurely. And when, when I finally saw this graph, wow, this, is, this really did meet the need that we thought it might need. Um, Elementary parents are asking for one too, but we won't go there because it's just, we, we're setting one up for elementary parents so they can talk to each other and set up play dates, given the amount of interaction we have here with the yeah. middle school, high school kids. I love that. And I also think what's great about these numbers is seeing, you know, how many views the content is getting. So, you know, to your point earlier, virtual spaces, I think, do encourage more shy people to speak up. So it's easier to talk when you have a little more control over how you're putting yourself out there. Um, but you still like, you know, a lot of people benefit from the community just by looking and watching what everyone else is doing. And you see that reflected in the number of, you know, views that posts are getting and students really learning from that process and benefiting from that process as well. Anything you want to add, Chris? Um. The, uh, it re really does look like a heartbeat. Uh, the kids <laughs> are really, uh, I mean, it's during the week, they really get engaged with this stuff, but they, they are accessing it just about any time of day or day of week. I mean, it certainly falls off on the weekends, falls off a little bit more on vacations, but, uh, you know, we're, we, we are seeing them in there and making posts and and reading things uh, quite frequently. So it, it, is, it is an excellent social hub now for them. And I'm, I'm feeling good now that they've uh, got the hand of using this, that we can start uh, deploying specific subject-based communities like math and English and science for kids to have, uh, ask those questions about their homework and uh, hopefully get replies from other students. Right. Um, you know, that makes it better for the students and it makes it better for, uh, for our poor teachers that are pretty frazzled. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which I think leads us really nicely maybe into this. Um, oh, well, we talked about this a little bit. Um, I'll come back to your, the comment you just made, Chris, because it gets interesting to think about the future. Um, we also had someone mentioned in the chat, you know, kind of fear of social media as a place to do this. I think sometimes, um, you know, people might think, well, maybe we'll create a group on Facebook or, um, I don't know if you guys ever thought about, one of the concerns that we hear from people, one is that that's not as protected of a space. So you don't have as much sort of control over it. And, um, you know, for younger kids, do they even have accounts there? Or like, you know, do you even have place? Is that even a place that they would want to go or necessarily think to go? So I don't know if you thought about that or any other social media tools as an alternative. Um, we've looked at, <clears throat> I looked at private forums because I was focusing more on the social interaction piece earlier on <clears throat> when we were looking at this. Um, but uh, social media spaces in the traditional sense, we would never never even think to do that. Um, 
you know, the, the nice thing about the inscribed spaces is that they're enclosed to the community, basically just the other students and teachers and, you know, all, everybody that has access to these spaces, of course, you know, as far as the adults are quarried and, um, you know, background checks, all that great stuff. Uh, our, um, and of course the students are, are of course students. So, yeah. um, but opening this up, trying to do this in, in like an area like Facebook where they have access to uh, everything and everybody has access to them. Uh, definitely that would be a no-go for us. Uh, online safety is paramount for us. Yes, totally understand. And of course, I think a lot of people thinking about that as well. Um, so we talked a little bit about student participation. I think, you know, we always encourage people to, you know, think about, um, you know, making sure the purpose of the community is clear, making it visible, you know, for you guys, you put it out there and your students just rush to it. So uh, I, what do you think was kind of the secret to your success? Do you have any, do you think there was any? Um, there was a huge, a huge vacuum. Um, yeah. The kids wanted this because they did not have that area to be social. And we, we have the, the, our systems very, uh, very locked down, um, preventing them from accessing all this other great stuff that they usually get on their other platforms, their personal computers, you know, anything outside of the school. Um, but it, it took very little uh, enticing on our part to get them in here and, uh, get them uh, going. I mean, we had just a few topics introduced. We had a few questions seated in there for them to start participating in. And, and they took off and they owned the process. They really pushed it out there for us. That's awesome. Yeah, incorporating so, that into that. Sorry, Sarah, go ahead. Well, um, and Chris is trying to bring in, Chris has worked with Inscribe to bring in the idea of gamification so that those who are really participatory and especially really helpful get badges. So we've started that process too, which is interesting. Yeah, we um, forgot to, we, or we didn't mention that in the process, but that sort of reputation or badging system that's baked into the platform can be very enticing and motivating for your participants and a way to kind of give them credit for all the wonderful activities and contributions that they're making to their classmates. That actually leads really nicely to the question that just came into the chat. Are you I was about, about to address it. <laughs> yeah, oh, wonderful. So are you worried about students becoming distracted um, by the, the gamification or by the, the use of Inscribe at all? Well, given that we were seeing all these Google Docs that we couldn't control going on, basically no passing in school, distractions are going to happen in a classroom. And we decided that was risk that was worth the risk because it was already happening. And maybe if we made a more enticing place, that they let go of the, the passing notes in class and come here. Hmm. Yeah, that uh, the, the problem with the Google Docs is it's very much under the radar. Um, with this, if they're coming out into the open where teachers can look at this stuff, um, and, and we, we have uh, what we call family engagement coordinators um, that work with, uh, with families and in, in, in kind of... Uh, uh, guiding them through the process of online school, those folks also keep an eye on uh, what the kids are doing. They're, they're the biggest core of our moderators for Inscribe. They also happen to know when the kids should be in class. So sometimes they'll see a post by somebody that should be in class. All it's taken is just a reminder, hey, this is for, you know, after class, you're in class, you're supposed to be in here and um, monitoring things. We also have a lot of other systems in place. Um, we have uh, a product that uh, lets teachers thumbnail what the kids are working on on their Chromebooks so the teachers can see. And if one of the kids is off into space they shouldn't be on, the teachers can always say, hey, you know, you're supposed to be back over here. Back. Uh, but we've had very, problems. very few problems. <laughs> and in fact, yeah. remember when um, Sue was looking, she goes, oh, here's one of my kids who's always truant, but at least he's talking here. <laughs> so he's, he's showing up in the lunchroom, so to speak, to hang out with his friends. And that, that was kind of rewarding. Right. Yes. The, like, at least they're coming somewhere and we're making contact and yeah. it's a good starting place. So tell yeah, us. Yeah, sometimes it's just little steps. Yes. 
Um, so tell us a little bit, I, I think we're going to focus on parents, but you also mentioned, Chris, that, you know, taking the idea of the student communities and moving them into the academic context so they can have a similar space, but for more like homework questions and that kind of learning. Um, and then just do you want to talk a little bit about, we're kind of coming full circle back to your original mission when we started, which was around parent support. What are you guys um, planning to do there? Uh, so that was um, one of the big things that we have is uh, like Facebook. It's it's kind of nice, but it, it's a little bit wild west. Things can really develop off into tangents. Uh, and previously, you know, we'd have to if we had frequently asked questions and stuff, we'd have to um, uh, take them, suss them out, post them in the website. Um, but with, with Inscribe, we're actually able to take questions that parents have posed to us and uh, add them to the online uh, frequently asked questions area uh, within Inscribe. And, and they, they don't become just this static display anymore, uh, but they're actually threads of communication. And we have, we have control over those. If, if you know, something is, is off topic or... Um, uh, rude or non-constructive, anything like that, we have the power to moderate that sort of stuff in our space. That's awesome. um, so we're actually getting more information out there to parents in a way that they can, um, you know, that they can actually participate in. And we get that active feedback, that living document. Yeah. As a parent of, you know, students going through this process, I appreciate that opportunity for two-way conversation as well where you you know sometimes you just have a specific question or there's like I just need to clarify something you know and you hate to pick up the phone and call somebody if you can just share that um, with everybody uh, and I know you're also looking at some spaces for perspective for parents for perspective students will that function similarly to where the space that you have for your existing parents yeah, the, the existing parents are, are more of a, uh, a built-in support system for parents. So the parents are able to communicate with each other as well and yeah. coordinate anything from play dates to um, questions about processes, all that great stuff. With the, uh, for the prospective parents, it's more about you know, questions about how the school works and, and building all of that stuff. So we can build that FAQ community right on our website um, via links to uh, to inscribe and i because I in, oh sorry go ahead sarah well just saying we when you have the faq and it's static you can't anticipate new questions and so when someone writes in about um we're getting a lot about well, what about out-of-state tuition that question sort of rising up in, in the rank so to speak because more people are asking it and we i don't think we would have had on our our, our faq um so that would, and that one is right on our webpage. So people coming in, see it and can ask questions and get the information they need. It was really going back to what Chris was saying about Facebook, the parents kept asking on Facebook because they wouldn't want to PM me and, and set up a play date for uh -huh. anyone living in the, now remember all of Massachusetts were uh, 172 towns or something like that. We have a, we serve the whole state. So the first thing is I live in this town. Anyone live near here? It's scary. By embedding it into um, a more private environment, parents, uh, and I've seen it now, my name is so-and-so, I live in this town, I got these kids, does anyone want to arrange a play date? We can go here and do this. So the, um, the comfort level with, with sharing and mm -hmm. putting yourself out there or personal information because you know it's a private space and a safe space that isn't going to be I mean, infiltrated is probably a bit extreme, but like, you know, that I would have said hijacked. But... <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually a better word. Um, just lends a, a, a layer, an air of, um, you know, op uh, openness to the conversation that you don't get always in other spaces. That is fabulous. So I think we have done a pretty good job answering the questions along the way, but I did want to pause and see if um, anyone in the audience has any Final questions for our panelists. Um, if you're thinking about setting up spaces for students or um, parents or academics that, you know, if you have any other questions or um, 
things that might help you in the process of making that decision, please let us know. Katie, it doesn't look like there's any additional questions, but there was a comment um, earlier in uh, at the webinar about um, how GCVS vetted Inscribe or just digital communities in general for implementation. That was Chris, because Chris has been looking for so long. He had this criteria in his head and did so much that I don't know what was in his head, but he'd been looking. <laughs> The, uh, there, there's a, yeah, there's a few different uh, processes, whether you're vetting a product for fit or you're vetting a product for uh, security. Um, in this case, it was kind of a, a, a matter of serendipity where Sarah had brought this and it neatly solved the social interaction piece along with the academic interaction piece um, that she was looking for. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had them all in one product. Um, the, uh, the nice thing about uh, Inscribe is that it does have, uh, you know, it, it has the ability to uh, integrate quite neatly with, with Google for authentication purposes. So if your school already uses Google, um, it, but they also have several different other systems. So if you, uh, as far as the security, the authentication piece, if you know and trust Google, um, then you're you're in good hands with uh, with uh, Inscribe's authentication with Google as well. Yeah. So again, that sort of duality of you know you have the the social purpose or the scale purpose, the information purpose, and but also making sure that the environment is secure and safe, um, and you know lives up to those standards probably would be something people are familiar with in that vetting process. I think sometimes we get really caught up with the idea it has to be face to face, but having a community in which people write is so much more better because you're so much more in control of your voice and presentation when you write. Yeah. Um, so academically it worked for us. And Karen, absolutely. That the reason we moved this community into our building, so to speak, is because Facebook, as Chris said, is a wild west. Parents were complaining and we can control it. And we wanted a place for a if there was a complaint it would come to us, we could address it as administration right. and not be behind our backs. Right. Have a constructive conversation about it versus you know, something happening that you don't, might not even be aware of and able to, to pick up exactly. on. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that is wonderful. So if there's any last minute questions, please post them. But um, I just wanna say to Sarah and Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I just think what you have built with your students is so impressive and very, um, I just, I feel wonderful. Every time I see the post come through it, how lovely. Oh, you cry, we know. I do, I, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's, very, it's very, they're very heartfelt. And I just think what you, to have the trust that you've had in your students and to give them that voice was, um, was exactly the right decision. And I can see that they're really benefiting from it. And I'm excited to see all the wonderful things you're gonna do in the future around academics and parenting. So thank you again for coming and sharing your story with us. It was just, um, I know I benefit from it every time I hear it and I'm sure our uh, attendees did as well. Well, thank you Inscribe for making this happen. Awesome. Um, for anyone out there who is interested or thinking about the idea of community building, we do have a self-assessment that can help you kind of think through how you're doing community today and whether there are some spaces and areas for improvement. So we will send out after this webinar a link to that assessment. So feel free to take it um, and we'll send you some personalized responses and recommendations. Oh, and I see that Daniel also just dropped that link into the chat. Um, so you can click that from there. Um, and then if you have any questions just about Inscribe or the work that we're doing, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Uh, happy to hear more about what you're trying to do, provide some advice if I can. And of course, we'd be um, happy to share a demo of Inscribe and see if we can help. So with that, I will thank everyone and I'll hang around for a minute or two in case there's any additional questions, but I appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, we did record this session, we'll send it out after and everyone have an awesome rest of your week.